Good afternoon, everyone from rainy Singapore. I, I tend to introduce myself uh, from warm and humid Singapore, but today it's uh, it's rather cold and, and rainy day here in Singapore. So good afternoon, everyone, to, to our audience who have joined us today for a talk or a dialogue, really, on Qatar-Iran relations after our ruler. Um, before I begin, and we of course, we have two distinguished guest speakers with us today for this dialogue. Uh, I'd like to lay down some house rules uh, regarding the Q&A segment, which will take place for most parts of today's webinar. Uh, from the 30th minute mark of, of, of this webinar, you are invited to put in your questions either via the chat box on Zoom, or you could alternatively raise your hand and we will then unmute you to ask your questions directly to our speakers. So today's subject of, of our dialogue is on the relations between Qatar and Iran. Qatar has taken the first steps to effect reconciliation with its Gulf neighbors. And that is following the al summit in January this year. And it has, Qatar has recently welcomed Saudi Arabia's new ambassador to Doha and elsewhere reports have also indicated that Bahrain has twice invited Qatar for bilateral talks to resolve differences and to strengthen regional cooperation. Yet against the backdrop of a diplomatic freeze from 2017 to 21, Doha found it vital to transit via Iran's airspace and territorial waters in order to circumvent the blockade that was imposed by the anti-Qatar quartet, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the UAE, and Egypt. So considering the Al-Ula declaration earlier this year, we are going to be asking our speakers, of course, as, as our First question later on, you know, will there be a reversal in the warming of Qatar-Iran ties that had gone on between 2017 and 21? The change in administration in Tehran uh, recently has led to a new conservative leadership and undeniably Doha's ties to Iranian rivals such as the US and Saudi Arabia remain of strategic value. So let us now begin by, by diving straight into our dialogue and as I remind our audience, you are free to put in your questions at the 30th minute mark. So let me introduce our speakers for today. Our first speaker is Professor Mihran Kamrava, who is a professor of government at Georgetown University, Qatar. He also directs the Iranian Studies Unit at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. Professor Kamrava is the author of a number of journal articles and many books, including A Concise History of Revolution, recently released by Cambridge University Press, Troubled Waters, Insecurity in the Persian Gulf under Cornell University Press in 2018, Inside the Arab State, Oxford University Press in 2018, and more relevant to today's discussion, Qatar, Small State, Big Politics, released by Cornell University Press in 2015. So we are pleased to welcome Professor Kamrava with us today. And our second speaker is Ambassador Nasser bin Hamad Barak al Khalifa, who was the ambassador recently of Qatar to the Republic of Croatia. He has an illustrious diplomatic career of over 40 years. Ambassador al Khalifa served also as Qatar's ambassador to the US from 2005 to 2008, to the United Kingdom, 2000 to 2005, and as well as Qatar's permanent representative to the United Nations from 1996 to 1998. Among other positions, he was also a non-resident ambassador to several European countries, Canada, also to Canada, Argentina, Colombia, and Cuba. Ambassador Khalifa has also represented Qatar at regional and international conferences and takes a keen interest equally in academic research, having completed fellowships at various universities, including Princeton, Harvard, and the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. So we are pleased to have Ambassador Al Khalifa with us today, and let us now dive straight into the dialogue. So the first question I would like to pose to our two speakers is about, you know, the aftermath of the Al Ula declaration earlier this year and, and Saudi Arabia's eagerness to restore diplomatic ties. So, you know, as a broad guideline, do you think there will be a, a reversal in the previous warming of Qatar Iran ties, and also considering the, the context of Saudi Iranian rivalry. So Professor Kamrava, I'll invite you to uh, take this question first. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Clements, for uh, uh, the honor of uh, inviting me, uh, giving me the honor to be here along with you and uh, His Excellency Al Khalifa, um, uh, with whom I have uh, exchanged uh, views and uh, had a very fruitful dialogue and from whom I've learned a great deal. And my thanks to you and uh, a Middle East Institute uh, for this event. Um, I don't think the Al Ula uh, declaration and the resolution of the Gulf crisis would adversely impact Iran's relations with Qatar. In fact, we saw that immediately after uh, the declaration, Qatar offered to mediate between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So I think, if anything, the warm relations that have existed between Tehran and Doha are only likely to deepen now that there's been a resolution uh, to the GCC. We, um, as you mentioned, uh, Iran, of course, um, uh, was one of the only countries in the region, uh, along with Turkey, Oman, and Kuwait, that uh, maintained warm and uh, close relations with Qatar. Uh, but I think now we are in a new environment internationally and strategically, and that enables the countries to move forward uh, in this new uh, environment. So I think, if anything, we're likely to see a deepening of the relationship between uh, the different actors. Thank you, Professor. Your Excellency, would you like to add on to, to what uh, Professor Kamrava has said, please? Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me, and I am honored to uh, meet you face to face now through the uh, Zoom, but also I am honored to uh, join uh, Professor Mehran and uh, your other colleagues. Uh, I, you know, I don't think I would, uh, I would not disagree with what Professor Mehran said. I think, you know, Qatar relation, you know, when you are talking about relation between the states, relation between the states depends on their geographical location. You see, Qatar and Iran, they are neighbors. Uh, we have a lot of commonalities uh, with Iran, not only Qatar alone, but the whole GCC. I mean, you know, Iran is a country where uh, which has a lot of uh, Arabic-speaking people on the other side of the goal. And uh, there is a family relation, you know, across the goal between the Gulf states and Iran. There's a lot of histories. I mean, you know, unfortunately, it is not uh, written and uh, in a way that it will spread. But, you know, there's a lot of history uh, going back thousands of years, and uh, especially if you look at the 19th century and 18th century, you will see uh, that in the other side of, uh, of the Gulf, on the, on the Iranian side, there were a lot of Arab uh, principalities which existed there. And uh, so the relation with Iran is, uh, is very important. Uh, it is very strategic. Uh, we we share beside the human factors. We we are sharing also uh, one of the largest uh, gas fields in the world, and uh, so geography, politics, families relation, as well as uh, uh, strategic relation and interest. So uh, Qatar, of course, uh, the all all. Uh, declaration and uh, what came out of it is very good for Qatar and for the GCC, but it would not affect uh, Qatar relation uh, with Iran. Uh, I think we are looking forward to have uh, excellent relation between Iran and the whole of the Gulf countries because Iran needs a, a stable region and we need Iran to be stable as well. You see the whole region now is going through very difficult times. If you look at what's happening in Iraq, what's happening in Afghanistan, what's happening in Syria. We need really to, 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 to have uh, um, uh, Iran uh, on board so we can stabilize the whole areas, uh, including, including what's going on in Yemen. So I, you know, to tell you the truth, no, uh, 
our relation with Iran will not be affected. Uh, it will continue and it will, uh, and this, you know, hopefully it will grow to the best of the two countries and the two people. Thank you, Excellency. I, if I if I may, may 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 take the discussion a bit further on on regional relations, and and I I refer to the tweets that were immediate out of fresh out of the declaration earlier this year, and, and Foreign Minister from from Iran, Javad Zarif, actually tweeted uh, following the declaration saying that congratulate to congratulate Qatar, and I and I quote uh, to our other Arab neighbors, Iran is neither an enemy nor threat. Enough scapegoating, especially with your reckless patron on his way out. Time to take our offer for a strong region. So, what do you make of it? Is there is there a sort of um, is is he implying you know really that Saudi Arabia is is the one that that has the most to lose out of that whole four year uh, blockade, Professor Kamrava? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, uh, now we have a consensus universally that Qatar came out of the blockade much stronger than it had been uh, prior to 2017. So that is a, by now a well-established fact in terms of domestic production in Qatar, its own uh, ability to stand on its feet. Uh, the, the effort, the attempt was to bring Qatar to its knees. And not only did that not happen, Qatar emerged stronger in um, uh, out of the blockade. So. Uh, and I think there's a, this isn't just something that is being said by someone who's sitting in Doha. I think if you were sitting in Riyadh or Abu Dhabi or, or Manama or anywhere else, uh, you would recognize this in terms of what is happening domestically in, uh, in the domestic economy, all the economic indicators, all the indicators of production. And uh, so I think what we have is a new strategic environment uh, in the post uh, Al Ola period. And, and I think it is what we have seen coming out of Riyadh is a realization of a need to change its modus operandi, particularly with the change of administration in Washington. Now we see there's the Baghdad track between the Saudis and the Iranians. Before that even, the Emiratis had started a security dialogue, very low key and minimal, but they had started some sort of a security dialogue with Tehran. And so uh, what, uh, and, and as a result, what we have is this effort on the part of the Saudis to hurry and improve relations, restore relations uh, with, uh, with Qatar. So I think you're absolutely right in the sense that Everybody has to adapt, but that ad adaptability is particularly acute in terms of backtracking on the part of the uh, Saudis and to a lesser extent, the Emiratis. I assume at some point we'll talk about uh, the UAE, but we know uh, that the Saudis have been far more eager to improve relations with Doha than the Emiratis. That, that track, Emirati Qatar track, is moving somewhat slowly. And then uh, the um, Bahrain track is moving even slower, uh, Bahrain Qatar track. But nevertheless, we see that there's been a keen awareness in uh, Riyadh that they need to hurry up and, uh, and reestablish relations uh, with Doha in a very cordial uh, manner. Thank you, Professor Kamarafa. And, and I, I will pass on, before I pass on to his Excellency, I would like to say that, you know, of course, the UA, then UAE Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Anwar, His Excellency Awa Gagash, who's now, of course, moved to another role. You know, he also voiced a more cautious view of, of the declaration and regional reconciliation. And he, he, I quote him, he said, it's a beginning of a new dialogue, but he didn't, you know, he wasn't that concrete and specific in saying that, you know, there was there's going to be full-fledged reconciliation. And of course, Professor Kamraba also mentioned the, the Bahrain case where we are seeing an even, even slower uh, uh, you know, warm-up in terms of, of, of reconciling uh, these relations. So, so Ambassador Al-Khalifa, what's your, what's your view? Uh, I think you know, what happened in, 
in 2017 was unexpected. Uh, do, you, do you hear me? Okay, so, uh, so uh, uh, you see, it is not easy for countries when they act in a way which affect their relation with other countries. And the basis of their act wasn't really convincing to anybody. So after three years and a half, uh, it wasn't easy for things to move fast. Yes, uh, Qatari Saudi relation is moving very fast. I mean, everything is restored, people going back and forth. And also with the UAE, I mean, you know, people are uh, traveling back and forth. But uh, uh, it, is, it is taking time because, you know, there are things which are psychological, people have to deal with, you know. It wasn't easy. What happened was really unexpected. It was damaging to everybody because the relation with these countries is, uh, is familial uh, relations. I mean, I have relatives uh, uh, in every country of these three Gulf states, uh, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and, uh, and UAE. And almost every Qatari has the same relation. So I think Yes, there is there is a lot of uh, there is uh, there is caution. It will take time with the UAE. It will take a little bit more time with other uh, with Bahrain. But I think you know the train started, and uh, you know, and it will not stop. I mean, uh, nobody is going to go back to what it used to be before uh, uh, January fifth. Uh, uh, 2021. So that is my take. Yeah. So, but I mean, are we going to see a potentially um, UAE Israel bloc considering, of course, the Abraham Accords that, that happened last September as well against a, a more Qatar Iran setup? Will we potentially see this kind of, you know, blocks in terms of, of, of the nations in, in, in the region as we make of the UAE reluctance in? reconciliation so far? Professor Kamraba. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, as, as His Excellency mentioned, the, uh, the, the rupture was completely unexpected, but it was also deeply hurtful. And I think it will take some time for the wounds to heal. I, and I don't think it would, uh, that healing would be in the uh, uh, next five years, probably next five to ten years, uh, the the trust has been broken. Uh, this was um, a, a family dispute of, um, of of really unprecedented proportions, and so I think it would take some time for trust. I there was a I recall an interview uh, with the Qatari Minister of um, Energy who said, "Look." Even if, um, even when the rift heals, uh, I'm not going to allow Qatari um, uh, uh, super tankers to dock in Dubai because now to dock in Jebel Ali because now they're not letting us dock there. And so, you know, the the uh, of course politics and diplomacy and strategic considerations always trump other factors, but I think the level of trust has been broken. And it would take some time for it to heal. So um, I don't necessarily envision a return to the pre-2017 um, days in the immediate future. Uh, Clemens, if I may just say something about the nature of the GCC, we know that the Gulf Cooperation Council has really two dimensions. It has a political dimension and it has a policy dimension. Policy dimension revolves around um, visa regulations, um, uh, uh, common currency, the pegging of the currency, uh, things that relate to immediate uh, po policy. The political dimension is much deeper. It has to do with uh, a, a common defense pact, it, uh, common security arrangements, uh, relations, and, and I think the political dimensions of the GCC will not uh, recover anytime in the near future. 
And so we might see a resuscitation of the policy aspects in terms of coordinating policy um, uh, in, uh, of movement, uh, regimes uh, governing uh, labor uh, movement, uh, visa regulations, those kinds of things we might see. But I sincerely doubt if in the near future, we're going to see meaningful regional integration, multilateralism um, in, in ways that uh, we had movements uh, prior to 2017. And, and if, if the rift of 2017 to 2020 has any lasting consequence, it is in living memory of policymakers of uh, kind of, you know, I, I don't think people are going to immediately put aside what transpired in those dark three years and say, all right, let's now kiss and make up and move on and move towards substantive uh, integration. Uh, of course, politics, we all know, is a very, um, you, you have to have nuance and it's, it's a complex game at uh, different levels that one has to play. Uh, but I think the, the distrust will always be there, at least in the immediate future. Thank you, Professor Kamrava. Uh, Ambassador Nasser, would you like anything to add from uh, add on to what Professor Kamrava has just said? Uh, I, I, you know, I think he said it. Uh, it will take time, you know, for the one to 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 call off. And uh, uh, look, uh, what happened in 2017? was something hurtful to everybody. And uh, uh, every, every category, but also a lot of people in these countries because they have, the, they have relatives. So even for some of the policymakers in these countries, it is very difficult now to acknowledge that what we have done was really uncalled for, it was above what is expected in international relations, especially when you look at countries, they are the same countries, you know, uh, uh, ruled by families, uh, they, they have the same history, they have the same economic base, they have the same threat, uh, they are in a region where they have to work together. And uh, yes, uh, on, the, on the political, it will take some time, but I think now everybody is realizing that it is very important to really deepen the relation in a way that what happened in June 2017 will never happen again. And for that, we need to, to do some changes. We have to create certain mechanism and code of conduct, which will be uh, uh, imposed on everybody. And that this is one. When it comes to policy, uh, you know, really, even during that time of uh, rupture, you know, they were uh, coordinating, and you know, in the on the on the you know in the field of security. I mean, they were you know they were a lot of cooperation uh, between you know different ministries uh, of interior and uh, different security apparatus. Uh, so uh, we 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 need sometimes we need we need to to feel we need to sit with each other more often we need to break the psychological uh, mindset because it takes time you see the worst things is, is not only you, you, you and when you take policies okay you take policies something wrong okay and uh, uh, you fix it. What is important in that in our region is the psychological effect. And the psychological effect uh, uh, affected everybody, affected people in Qatar, but affected people on the three other uh, Gulf countries, especially their officials who were involved. I mean, you know, look, I mean, it was they who decided one day, okay, we will, uh, do this, and then a few a few weeks later, we will cut relation. You don't cut relation. I mean, countries have a problem, but they keep the diplomatic channels open. 
So it will take time, but I am very hopeful. Um, and uh, I, under, I know, I know, I know from uh, sources in these countries that really they want to, they want to come uh, back to what it used to be uh, before uh, 2017, but it will take time. You know, there are, you know, with the Saudis, things move very fast. I mean, completely, really, really fast. And with Egypt as well, which is not part of the GCC, with the Emirates, it's moving slowly. With Bahrain, there are still certain issues, but I am very hopeful uh, that by the end of the year, a lot of the issues will be dealt with, not completely, but at least an agreement have, uh, would be uh, in a place whereby how to move forward. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and we are talking about regional cooperation and also, of course, healing wounds. But, but if you look at, of course, the events that have taken place over the last year or so, and, and we, we, of course, see, and I'm talking here about uh, you know, extra regional influences, and we are seeing, of course, a change in U.S. administration. And, and, and of course, in response to that, the Gulf states are certainly recalibr recalibrating their, their specific respective policies. And so, you know, in this regard, you know, is Qatar um, offer to mediate, for example, in other arenas such as, number one, the U.S., uh, Iran, indirect talks on the JCPOA, for example, and also uh, the US Taliban talks, you know, what, what can we make out of Doha being an effective mediator and will, will its requests and offers be accepted in, in that regard? So perhaps we should start with uh, Ambassador Khalifa this time around. Uh, look, uh, the change of the, of the US administration is, is you know is a normal event. Every four years there will be a new administration, and uh, so uh, yes, there are some worries about certain policies uh, which the new administration might take, which will affect the 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 status quo of the region a little bit because you know they they there's a lot of uh, pronouncement uh, coming out. There are. They, you know, they are getting out of Afghanistan faster than what anybody expected them to do. And that will have its effect on their, in the whole uh, region. Uh, so uh, yes, there's some worries, but personally, I am not worried, you know, because the US GCC relation, look, as I said it to somebody, as long as there is oil exported to China, India, and to other countries and Japan, the U.S. will be involved in the goal. It is not, the American are not in the goal because they like our eyes or they like our dishes. I think they have, you know, they have their own. Uh, they are there because of the strategic uh, location of the goal, because of the oil and gas, because these are st strategic assets. And the American, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, uh, the Carter Doctrine, it was really, it wasn't because of Afghanistan, it was because of the goal. Uh, so, you know, the, the American till and the Russian, you stop there. I mean, you know, you cannot move to the other, uh, to the west of uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So uh, their relation will be there. There will be some uh, correction here and there. And I think it is needed. You know, we in the Gulf, we have to understand that nothing is static. And uh, foreign affairs is changing, you know, and uh, people have to be ready for different eventualities. This is one. When it comes to Qatar playing a role of mediator, look, you, you mediate when the other two parties who are having some disputes wanted you to play a role. Qatar will welcome everybody, like what we have done with the uh, American and the Taliban and the Afghan governments. We offer them the space, we offer them the, 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 the time, we offer them the, all the logistics, but we don't intervene. 
it is not our business to tell them, look, you know, you have to do this or that. It is up to them. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, if you look at what, uh, what's happening now in, you know, in Afghanistan, you know, uh, I am not sure. I, I mean, Qatar did what it can. And if the American and the Iranian want Qatar to play a role, I assure you that the leadership will welcome them and we will, we will facilitate. But we have to understand one thing. It is up to the contenders themselves to be ready and to accept somebody to play a role, just bringing them together, giving them the space, okay? But uh, Qatar said it again and again that they are, they are ready to work with everybody. They are ready to mediate if they are asked, but that is up to them. Thank you, Ambassador. So strategic stakes by the US in the region. And of course, uh, you know, in terms of mediation, of course, it needs to be accepted by the, the two sides, right? two parties, which is, you know, who are involved in whatever conflicts that, or crises that, that are at hand or at issue. So Professor Kamrava, would you, would you agree with Ambassador's uh, remarks on that? I do, but I think, uh, yes, I do, absolutely. I think it's also important to keep in mind that there are different kinds of mediation. There's a kind of mediation where you provide good offices and you step back and uh, you provide um, a confidential uh, secret location where people can talk. So for example, if you look at Oman and prisoner exchange between Iran and the United States, Oman has performed that function. There are many prisoners uh, in the United States, many Iranians who've been held in the United States on various reasons. And there are uh, dual citizens or dual nationals uh, that have US citizenship that are held in Iran. And over the years, Oman has performed a very effective mediation between Iran and the United States in providing its good offices but simply a location where nobody knows about, they just go sit in an office in the foreign ministry and they mediate and the Omanis stay outside the door or outside the room and say, if you need us, we'll step in. The, there's another kind of mediation where you do it in the glare of public media. You do it in, the, in, uh, in um, full view of the media, uh, and uh, and that is more uh, Qatari style, where, for example, when um, uh, Lebanon was on the verge of civil war, uh, we had the uh, Doha round. When uh, Darfur was uh, in flames in Sudan, Qatar mediated between uh, the different warring factions, the Americans and the Taliban. And this style of mediation which in you might say is distinctively Qatari is different because it isn't, it is in the public eye and the Qataris not only lend their good offices, but they also facilitate in the full glare of the media. And, and each of these mediation techniques has its pros and cons. You might say, for example, that when you do this publicly, then there's pressure on the different sides to um, come to some sort of consensus, come to some sort of agreement. So uh, it's not that one uh, technique or one mediation strategy is better than the other, or one is more likely to lend in, uh, to, uh, end up in results. So uh, I think different mediation techniques uh, are called for in different scenarios. And we saw this quite effectively, as I mentioned, in um, Lebanon, in Darfur, in relation to the Taliban. And as we move forward, as developments arise, situations arise, and uh, this sort of kind of public mediation is called for, we're, we're likely to see this. I think it's also, keep, uh, it's also important to keep in mind that Qatar's role in mediation really reached a peak um, prior to the Arab Spring. Again, when we had a different strategic environment 
And after 2011, the regional strategic environment is decidedly different. Uh, now we have uh, this uh, new phenomenon, which is new of sectarianism, having become a strategic tool by different actors that is being used. Uh, we have a polarization of the environment. We have now the Emiratis that are trying to project power and influence uh, beyond the uh, uh, Arabian Peninsula, far beyond uh, the GCC. So we have a new strategic environment. Uh, and so as we move forward, this is bound to impact significantly Qatar's diplomatic profile uh, when it comes to uh, me, uh, its role in uh, mediating regional conflicts. And of course, Professor Kamrova, you, you wrote about Qatar's hyperactive diplomacy uh, across you know, the 2010 to 2020 decade. Uh, uh, Ambassador Nasser, would you, would you uh, agree with uh, Professor Kamrova's statement on, on how you know, there are two types of mediation and, and the fact that one is in full view of the media, which, which, uh, which is, you know, has its own pros and cons, Ambassador. Well, I, I completely agree with the, the, with the, with the professor uh, on this. Uh, but you see, the type of mediation you can't play, uh, and if it's uh, in the open or uh, secret, like what the American and the Vietnamese have done uh, when they used to have their meetings in, uh, in France outside Paris, and what the Omanis uh, have been doing, that has, uh, is, uh, it is up to the two parties, because I assure you, if any of these parties who came to Qatar, asked Qatar to play a role, if they said, we want it to be secret, Qatar will provide them uh, an arrangement where nobody knew about it unless if they talk about it themselves. Uh, so yes, you 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 put the, if it's in the open like what uh, Qatar been doing it. Uh, yes, there is a pressure on the uh, on those who are involved, but also uh, it might uh, backfire because you know. Uh, 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 if any one of them does not like what they are asked from the other side and, and they disagree or they break uh, up their meetings, uh, you as a mediator will be in a very difficult position. Uh, and, uh, and of course, um, our region, the whole region, uh, not only the GCC, but the whole region now is going through a very difficult time. Uh, I, I, I will be a mess uh, uh, if not technology in that. We, we have a problem, Yemen, uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Syria, Libya, uh, what's happening in the occupied uh, Palestinian lands. Uh, uh, you, you see, we are in worse situation today than 20 years ago. And that is amazing because 20 years ago, we thought we will be much better today than what we used to be. And that affects Qatar, affects all the whole GCC because as countries which have been given a lot of aid to a lot of countries around Qatar and the other GCC countries, they spent tens of billions of dollars, maybe reached a few hundred billion of dollars over the past 20 years. And you look today at all these countries where the money went and they are in trouble. Either they are having civil wars or they are almost broken uh, countries, broken societies. You know, if you look at what's happening in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen, that is devastating. And that affects us because we are not, we cannot, if our surrounding is in this mess, even if we, if we in the Gulf ha, don't have our own problem among ourselves, we are still having a problem. It's like, you know, uh, you, you have a nice villa and you are surrounded by uh, huts and they are on fire. Uh, you, you know, sooner or later you will, you will pay for it. 
So uh, that, that also will affect the role of the group of all the GCC countries. Even those who are, you know, uh, projecting themselves outside. I think later on they will realize that there is a limit. And uh, we, we, need, we need a region from the borders of uh, India uh, to the borders of, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Atlantic, you know, like, you know, as far as Morocco. We need it to be stable because if it's stable, I think everybody will benefit. Everybody, not only in, uh, in that area, but in the whole world. But if things continue just deteriorating the way it is, uh, to tell you the truth, I am not, I am a bit worried. And, you know, that is not easy to say, but I tell you, I am, a lot of people are optimistic. I am not anymore, you know, after what, but what happened in the last 10 years and what I see now, I am even worried for the GCC as a whole. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and I'd like to pick up on, on what uh, Professor Kamrava has said about a strategic environment. And of course, we, we agree, we can agree that it's, it's a changing uh, environment, it's a changing, ever-changing regional dynamics. And I'd like to pick up on that because uh, over over the four years, 2017 to 2021, of course, Qatar's, you know, Qatar has to find alternatives in terms of circumventing the blockade. And one way was to go through Iranian airspace, but also uh, the ties with Turkey improved over that period of time. And, and you know, what are the stakes comparatively in both bilateral relations? Maybe we can, we can start with Ambassador Al Khalifa on that. Uh, could you uh, please, you know, just explain your question a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, really, how does Qatar's Iran, Qatar's relations with Iran, you know, uh, uh, measure up comparatively in its relations with Turkey? So how how do we understand the degree of depth in between these two bilateral uh, relations? You see, our relation with Iran is uh, is uh, is a necessity. It is geography. It is a human familial uh, link. Uh, it is also uh, security, okay? When it comes to Turkey, Turkey, we have very close relation. We are allied. I mean, you know, Turkey you, you came to Qatar support from day one. Uh, and uh, it is the only country in the Middle East which has uh, forces in Qatar. And we have Qatari forces also in Turkey. I mean, you know, we, we, are, we are working together. Uh, there is, a, it is a Sunni country, so that also has its own dimension. Um, uh, and uh, for us, both countries are very important. One is our neighbor, and we have to have the best relation with our neighbor. And the other one is our ally, and uh, our relation is, is deepening every day uh, with uh, Turkey. There's a lot of investment going into Turkey. There are thousands of uh, Turkish nationals now moving to Qatar to work in different jobs like everybody else. So uh, uh, personally, I think you know, their relation with these two countries will go forward. Uh, it is, uh, uh, we hope Iran will have excellent relation with our other brothers in the Gulf because we think it will be for the best of, the, of Iran and the best of the Gulf. And if we can work together, if we can have some arrangement whereby we, we work together, we can solve a lot of the problem surrounding us. Uh, for, you know, as far, you know, from Afghanistan to uh, Libya and to Yemen. Uh, because Iran, whether uh, uh, we like it or not, is involved in some of these countries. And its involvement is, we don't agree with it, uh, especially in Syria and uh, in, and, uh, in Yemen, we have our difference. Uh, but we think Iran could help uh, in, the, uh, in these issues and Iran will benefit because if Iran has excellent relation with this neighbor, there will be a lot of investment going into Iran. Iran 
is a country which needs a lot of investment. It has most of its population. They are very young people. You have more than 80 million human beings. They have to be part of the, of the future and they need job. Uh, they need to, I mean, the world now is becoming, we are connected. We, you know, before if something happened in another country, maybe it will take you weeks to, other, to know what's happening. Today, young people are connected from everywhere. I mean, you know, with the new technologies and com you know, communications, uh, Iranian are aware of what's happening all over the world. People, people in Qatar, the same. You and me now, we are thousands of uh, miles and we look at each other. So this is, this is, this is, this is, uh, so relation with Iran is very important. It's very, uh, as I said, it is a matter of necessity. Clemens, may I add to that? Yes, please, Professor. Thank you. I completely agree with His Excellency. I think he's spot on. Uh, Qatar's relations with Turkey are uh, robust, deep, strong, and multidimensional. As His Excellency mentioned, they are economic and commercial with um, a lot of Qatari investments in Turkey, a lot of uh, Turkish uh, consulting and engineering and construction firms uh, in Qatar. Uh, there is also uh, diplomatic and strategic ties that bind the two countries together. Uh, Qatar has an ally in Istanbul, in uh, Ankara, uh, but also for Ankara's, from Ankara's perspective, uh, Doha is important because it wants to project power and influence beyond uh, the region into the Horn of Africa. This is, a, in fact, the base, the Turkish base that's here is really a forwarding base. It's a staging base. Uh, for Turkey. And so strategically, Qatar is important. And also there is some sort of ideological common denominator between um, the current Turkish government and uh, the, the Qataris. It, uh, uh, this whole uh, uh, stuff about Muslim Brotherhood is way blown out of proportion. That's not what I mean by any stretch of imagination. But there is some sort of ideological common denominator and, and commonality that binds uh, uh, Istanbul, by, I keep saying Istanbul, that binds Ankara and, uh, and Doha together. And then I think it's important to keep in mind that there is a personal chemistry between President Erdogan and Sheikh Tamim. Uh, despite the difference in age, the, these guys genuinely seem to get along and like each other. And I think that is not without significance. Uh, there's one thing about Iran that I think needs to be part of the conversation. You know that Iran for the last however many years, particularly since 2013 with the Rouhani administration has been trying to improve relations with the Saudis and the Emiratis. In fact, Iran presented the HOPE initiative, Hormoz Peace Endeavor, uh, that would be a strategic initiative that would bring uh, the region together. We can talk about the problems with the HOPE initiative, but importantly, Iran did present it. The Saudis didn't bite, the Saudis didn't take, because they said, well, Zarif and Rouhani don't matter, it's the IRGC, and Khamenei that called the shots. And now, of course, with a new conservative president and this ideological and factional uniformity within the Iranian political system, the Saudis cannot say, well, it's Khamenei that calls the shots and the presidency and the foreign ministry do not matter. So I think, again, this, um, a recent election in Iran and the impending change in administration in Tehran bodes well for regional peace and stability because now what we see is that there is factional uh, uniformity in Iran, ideological uniformity in Iran, and that ideological uniformity could in fact bode well for Iran speaking for once 
in the post Khomeini era speaking from the same page. And, and I think that is very important. Um, it's almost like Nixon opening up China, Nixon going to China. And, uh, you know, if anybody could improve relations with the Saudis, uh, it, uh, it's much more likely to be Raisi than Rouhani or, for example, Khatami, uh, former president, because again, there is now uniformity in Tehran and Tehran is speaking with one voice. Importantly, quite significantly, in his first press conference, Raisi said, not only does he want the uh, nuclear deal to move forward, but he went out of his way to say that he wants to improve relations with the Saudis. And I think um, uh, it's uh, what we need to now wait and see is once he take takes office, will he follow that up with concrete actions? And then how would the Saudis uh, and the Emiratis react to that? Thank you, Professor Kamrova. And, and I would like to ask for for the opinion of uh, his ambassador. But before I, I pass it on to him, let me remind our audience that you can put in your questions We're way past the, the 30, 30 minute mark. So, so please, uh, you could put in your questions via the Zoom chat box and we will, of course, forward it on to our two speakers. So Ambassador Al-Khalifa, what, what do you think of, of uh, Professor Kamrava's remarks earlier on the conservative uh, I, administration? Uh, you know, I... I would I would agree with him, but I think, uh, look, uh, I agree with him that if somebody um, who, that for the first time, you have the president who is closely uh, linked to the, uh, to the, uh, to other, to Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, and uh, of course, if he uh, move forward, uh, in his uh, contact with the Saudis, Emirates, and the rest of the world, I think it will be welcome. Uh, but we have to wait because you see, uh, in in my business, I always try to. It is not what people say, which is important to me. What is important is what they have not said. It is not to any declaration, you know, some, sometimes you will hear uh, nice words or, but I like to know what they omitted, what wasn't in it, what wasn't in the, in the, in the, in the pronouncement. And that is, that is diplomacy, you know, because a diplomat cannot depend on what he will say to him, but he will try to find out what they kept Okay, because words uh, carry different meaning. So we hope, personally, I, I, I think uh, uh, incoming President Tracy, uh, he, 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 has, he has a chance and, and he has the backing uh, of, the, of the most powerful uh, person in Iran. And uh, uh, everybody is waiting. We are very hopeful because really we need uh, if the relation between Iran and the Saudis and the Emirates, because uh, really Iran has no problem with the with Qatar or Kuwait. I mean, it's uh, or Oman. So uh, you know the difficulties is with the Saudis, Bahrainis, and Emirates. If we move forward and if we extend hand. And then we can all work together with Iran. You know, we can reach some uh, 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 operating mechanism whereby we solve, first of all, we, we build the bridges through investment, through joint venture, through making it easy for people to move back and forth so they know each other. Though I, I know a lot of Iranian and they are very, very nice people. I mean. They were my uh, schoolmates, uh, uh, you know, in America, you know, a lot of families, and they were, they are one of the most generous people. They are very close to the Arab, and they you know, you know, in their traditions. They always welcome you in their homes, they cook food for you, and they, you know, you feel like your family. So when it, if we can't reach some, 
uh, arrangement. I think we can solve a lot of a problem. I think the whole Middle East will change completely. But that needs the Saudis and the Iranian and the Emiratis and the Bahrainis to really understand each other and to take every uh, and to take their concerns because each country has its own concern. And Iran is, uh, is you know, is uh, is a big country. I, I mean, if you know, it, Iran must show that it is really sincere. And if Iran does that. Uh, and 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 we build the bridges. We create interdependence uh, in different fields, including energy, electricity, uh, trade, investment. Uh, I think I think I think if we you know if the presidents uh, uh, start a good dialogue with the other countries, I think it will be for. The best to the people of Iran and the, and the people of the Gulf and the whole and the whole Middle East. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and I want to add on to that with another question because uh, with the Gulf Cooperation Council and and how how far and how far do you see the possibility of integrating Iran in in, in within GCC framework GCC related framework? Of course, Iran came up with the Hormuz peace plan sometime recently. And, and, and we, we will not forget also Iran was invited to a GCC summit back in 2007. So how far, have, how far along have we moved since then? And, and, and can we understand the, the GCC still as a, an effective mechanism? And you know, the second question, of course, like I said, can we include Iran in, in certain uh, talks? So perhaps we should start with uh, Professor Kamrava on that one. Uh, thank you. Uh... Clemens, that's a really good question. In order to devise a meaningful and substantive uh, regional um, cooperative arrangement, security arrangement, you have to get everybody together and have them start from scratch. If you have a pre-made framework and you say, well, why don't you come and join it? That's going to be far more difficult so for if you have already the GCC in place and say, tell Iran, well, why don't you come and join? And this is the framework you have to adapt. That's going to be difficult. In fact, that's what the problem was with the Hormoz peace plan, Hormoz uh, peace endeavor. The Iranians devised the framework and they presented it. Rohani wrote a letter to the King of Saudi Arabia he wrote a letter to the King of Bahrain, and he said, this is our peace proposal, our proposal for a regional security architecture, come and join it. The problem with that is that a framework has already been devised. And so you almost feel like if you go and join it, you're um, playing rear guard action. You're or already reacting to somebody, something that has already been decided. So, I think it would be far more meaningful to get everybody together and say, what are your legitimate security concerns? What are your red lines? And what are areas of mutual dialogue? Let's start with low hanging fruits where we can get a conversation going instead of hurling insults at each other across the water and then move forward, build on that. And so I think uh, while it would be you know, it would be interesting for particularly for those of us scholars <clears throat> to look at this heroic diplomacy and look at people, you know, invite this guy or that guy. Much more meaningful and substantive would be for a dialogue to get started and say, what are your security concerns? Let's l explain to us what your security concerns are. And, uh, and then what are some of the areas where we can build on and start a dialogue? I think that would be much more meaningful as we move forward. Thank you, Professor Kamrova. Your take, Ambassador Khalifa, in terms of <coughs> inclusivity. No, I, I think, I, you know, I agree with uh, Professor Mehran. Uh, look, the GCC cannot accept Iran as, as a member of the GCC. Uh, you know that 
That idea was floated a long time ago to, to include Iran, Iraq, and, and, and Yemen. And it was rejected because uh, you, you see, the GCC is, is made of countries which have uh, common features in terms of their political system, in terms of their economy, in terms of their relation of people, in terms of geography. So uh, I think any, 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 any security or cooperative arrangement has to be something new. And I agree with uh, Professor Mehran. You see, people have to sit together. They have to uh, discuss things. They have to build the trust because there's no trust. You see, okay, uh, if anybody tell you that, you know, any Gulf country official, a trust Iranian official, he is lying. Uh, there's no trust because Iran is involved in Iraq. So we like to see Iran first helping the Iraqi governments to really be a completely independent government, not to have militias who are creating havoc, destroying the life of Iraq's people, and also in Syria and in Lebanon. I mean, Iraq, uh, I mean, Iran has a lot of luggage to get rid of. And, 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 and if, if, if the new president and his governments, uh, with the approval of the Ayatollah, if, if he move on these issues, you know, people will watch what the new government, the new president will be doing uh, in terms of Iran relation with Iraq, Iran relation with uh, Syria, Iran uh, involvement in Yemen, uh, Iran involvement in Lebanon. You know, Lebanon now is uh, is a uh, paralyzed uh, country. And uh, of course, everybody knew why, because there is, uh, there is one militia which is stronger than the whole government. And this militia says uh, its loyalty is to Iran. So, you know, you, 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 you see, international system is built on states, independent states. You cannot have one country which is in control of a lot of faction within other countries, military factions. We are not talking about, okay, like, political parties like what the Soviet Union used to have in Western Europe, you know, the communists, the socialists, et cetera, et cetera, in the, in the, in the, in the 50s, in the 60s, and in the 70s, and even up till uh, 1989, uh, uh, okay? What Iran is doing, Iran is involved in these countries, and for us in the Gulf, that affects us. Uh, so if anybody will tell you that, okay, we can't sit with Iran, we can't discuss what is, uh, uh, what is our concern, security, et cetera, economic, et cetera, and we really trust them, he is lying. There's no trust. So we need to build the trust. And that will take some time. People have to sit. People have to show all their cards. Not to, not, you know, not Middle Eastern uh, niceties. And, and this is what I don't like about about us Arabs. We are trying sometimes to be nice. And also they, the Iranians do the same. I mean, you know, very uh, beautiful language, et cetera, but when it comes to, what do they mean? Uh, so uh, that, is, that is needed. We need, we, you know, there is, there, is, there is a need to build the trust in order to agree on the framework, in order for that framework to be agreed on and then to be operational. And that takes time. I don't think anything will happen quick now. Let us see what is, you know, in the next few weeks, what the new president will be doing, not only saying, we need act, because act is very important. So that is my take. Thank you. Professor Kamrava. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, the, uh, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, state actions, all states act because of um, a whole variety of reasons. And some of those reasons have to do with reactions. I mean, we can go back and forth um, about 
um, Iranian actions, but I think it's also important in the conversations and also in our mindset to understand why Iran is doing some of the things that it is doing. Uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, uh, they're not innocent. And I think that is important to keep in mind. Saudi Arabia is doing stuff in Iran, Sistan, Baluchistan, in Iranian Khuzestan that nobody would want done in their own country. And so I think, um, you know, and the, you know, what is the United States doing uh, in Iraq, for example, or in Afghanistan? If you look at it from Tehran's perspective, they're in circle. So the Iranians are not innocent by any stretch of imagination. But I think it's important to keep in mind that state actions are often reactions to certain things. Uh, I don't think you can say, for example, that uh, in the last five, six years, the Saudis have been a source of stability. Uh, you have a very erratic uh, political leader in, in Riyadh who has taken a prime minister hostage, has tried to create a canal between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. They tried to bring Qatar to its knees. Uh, he has just tried to have a, a, a palace coup in Jordan. Uh, you know, so you're really dealing with an actor uh, that is not innocent. The Saudis, the Qataris have not been innocent in Syria. Iranian action in Syria is not being taken in isolation, the Saudis have not been innocent in Iraq. So yes, Iran is present in Yemen, but who else is invading Yemen? So I think this is precisely the mindset we need to get out of, this kind of uh, engaging in this orgy of blame and counter blame. And we, what we need to do is to start a dialogue in terms of what is Iran's legitimate security concerns. Why is Iran behaving the way it does? Why, what are Saudi Arabia's legitimate security concerns? Why is Saudi Arabia behaving the way it does? Why is Qatar, United Arab Emirates? Uh, what are the security concerns of the regional actors? And what are the ways for us to get out of this vicious cycle of blaming everybody because of their innately un untrustworthy or their innately sectarian actors or their elate, innately illogical actors. What are some of the uh, common denominators that we can build on and get out of this vicious cycle of blame and counter blame? Thank you, Professor Kamravain. And I think on, on, on your remarks, maybe I would add uh, one question which comes from the floor, uh, Tracy. Um, so the question is about, you know, between its regional neighbors, and Iran and Turkey, uh, which side would have more priority in Doha's foreign policy? Um, and and I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, Ambassador Al Khalifa. Ambassador? Yeah, we uh, got you back. Sorry, sorry, we, you know, we got uh, cut. Uh, I think I think it will be difficult to look. Uh, you know, uh, to choose is very difficult. I think you know we are not in this position uh, to to really. If the, you, you know, if I if I understood the question between Iran and uh, and Turkey. I think they they all very important, uh, and uh, it is not uh, A or B. It is it is all. I mean, we we our relation with Iran is as I said, it is uh, it is a matter of 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 necessity. Our relation with uh, Turkey is very strategic, uh, so both are very important. So I think you know that question should be. Uh, phrased in a different uh, dimension, not in this way, because this is, uh, you know, somebody will tell Qatar which one uh, is it Turkey or Iran, we will say we are very sorry, we never thought of that. 
Thanks, Ambassador. Professor Kamrava, in terms of uh, Qatar's, you know, you know, friends for all posture in this sense, and is there is there a prioritizing in terms of foreign policy? Well, uh, let's not forget that Iran is under international sanctions. And so in terms of, for example, commercial and trade relations between Qatar and Iran, there's only so much Qatar can do. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, uh, Turkey is not under American sanctions in terms of its trade relations. So by default, Qatar's relations with Turkey have dimensions that Qatar's relations with Iran technically cannot have because of, for example, sanctions, banking sanctions. We also heard from His Excellency that Iran is not trustworthy. So there is a, you know, just as the Iranians don't trust their neighbors, the neighbors don't trust Iran. And so there's that, that element. I know, for example, that there are visa and entry restrictions on Iranians into Qatar in 20, uh, 17 or 2018, after the blockade, Qatar removed visa restrictions on a number of countries. Conspicuously absent from that was Iran. In fact, at, uh, so there is this kind of wall of mistrust between Iran and Qatar that has existed. At the Singapore Security uh, Conference, the Qatari Defense Minister uh, probably to placate the Saudis, at least according to the Iranians, he came out and stated that Iran is a security threat to Qatar. The defense minister of Qatar said this at a time when Iran had was the only lifeline that Qatar Airways had to fly out in and out of Doha. So there is this fine, uh, 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 fine, uh, balance that the Qataris have to play in relation to the other GCC states, in relation to the Americans. And, and so they have to handle Iran with a level of care that they do not have to worry about when it comes to their relations with uh, the Turks uh, or probably anyone else. Uh, so there are, uh, I think, you know, we need to take into account the broader uh, environment, the sanctions, the uh, uh, the American factor, uh, as much hedging as the Qataris might be able to do, they also do not want to completely alienate uh, their largest security uh, guarantor and security provider, which is the United States. Thank you, Professor Mehran. Um, and and I, I would like to come back to your earlier comments on, of course, Saudi Arabia's involvement in other arenas. And, and we have one more question from O.D. Mayer in, in the floor. And I think this, this has to do in response, perhaps, to, to, to the comments earlier. So can you outline Qatar's links with Islamist organizations that were part of the anti-Qatar quartet demands? And are there further steps taken to play down these things and de-escalate tensions in this aspect. So, um, Professor Kamrava. Uh, Qatar has pursued a strategic relationship with multiple actors uh, in the region. This relationship has been strategic rather than ideological. So when Qatar, for example, uh, houses Hamas here in Doha, that is out of strategic calculations rather than ideological considerations. Uh, same thing with these um, Muslim Brotherhood, whose presence in Doha is blown way out of proportion by uh, the Americans, the Israelis, the Saudis, the Emiratis, and those that have had an anti qatar agenda. I certainly have studied this country and I don't see it. I don't claim to have unique knowledge about the country. But I don't see an ideological affinity between the state apparatus here and Islamist actors beyond instrumental strategic use of Qatar of these, um, of these um, actors. And so we see that in relation, for example, to Al Jazeera, we see it in relation to others. The demands of the, the 13 demands, you know that, um, in 2017, when relations were cut 
and boycott was imposed on Qatar, the quartet imposed uh, 13 points on Qatar, one of which was, for example, to get rid of Iranian uh, revolutionary guards and, and cut relations with, uh, with Iran. There is no revolutionary guards. This is those demands were made not to be met. They were completely uh, beyond uh, anything that was reasonable. They were completely uh, ridiculous in nature and they were presented so that they wouldn't be made. What Qatar did was it did nevertheless ask some uh, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood members here to leave. They left voluntarily. They went to um, Turkey. Uh, well, they said they were leaving voluntarily. They were no doubt encouraged to leave or asked to leave. But they went to Doha. They thanked Qatar for its support. And what we're likely to see, the, the change that we already do see is, for example, in Al Jazeera's coverage of Saudi Arabia. We're likely to see a changed tenor in Al Jazeera's editorial line when it comes to uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, when it comes to, you, we, we all know that, for example, Al Jazeera gave ample coverage to the murder of uh, Khashoggi. Uh, you know, those kinds of issues in terms of the imprisonment of Saudi human rights activists, those things are likely to get a slightly different coverage um, in Al Jazeera. But in terms of Qatar's kind of being in cahoots with Islamists, that was never the case to begin with. So I don't anticipate uh, any meaningful changes in that uh, on that front, because uh, those of us who study this country in a serious way know that that doesn't really exist. Thank you, Professor Kamrava. Excellency, would you like to add anything? I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, it has been overblown uh, Qatar uh, linkage to the uh, Islamist, uh, you, you know, these, these people are Muslim like us and they are Arabs. And uh, when it comes to the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, you know, in the 60s, when I was a kid, most of our teachers who been uh, lended to, to us by the Egyptian government, they were, some of them, they were from the Muslim Brotherhood, including Sheikh Al-Qardawi, who came in the 60s. And all his children were born in Qatar. I mean, and some of these people, they are Qataris now. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, if you look at Egypt, for example, uh, millions and millions of people, they, they are members of the Muslim Brotherhood. So should we say, oh, if you are a Muslim Brotherhood, you, you are not welcome in Qatar, or we cannot deal with you. Uh, governments uh, in, uh, at one time in Tunis, uh, it was mostly Islamist uh, after, after, after the, uh, you know, the change of, uh, of of the regime of, uh, of Zain al-Abidin. And uh, now even in Morocco, the government is uh, Islamist uh, government. Uh, so our relation with them is, for us, it is normal. They are people like us, they are Arab, they are Muslim, we are Muslims. Okay, mostly, most of the Qataris, they are Muslims. And some of them, they were our teachers. Some of them, they were our uh, classmates because the children who were born there, Okay, uh, his father is uh, used to be a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, but there is no uh, a presence of uh, like uh, Muslim Brotherhood as 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 an organization in Qatar. And uh, yes, we we dealt with the you know after the uh, the the Arab uh, revolt, uh, not the spring because I wish it was a spring, but uh, it's. Just, uh, it went the other way around, uh, but you know when 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 the when the when 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 Morsi was elected by the Egyptian uh, people, we we dealt with him not as a Muslim Brotherhood leader, but as the president of Egypt, uh, and and uh, so I think 
most of the most of the complaint really uh, they knew nothing between Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood, but they weren't happy with Al Jazeera. Okay. And Al Jazeera is a headache to every Qatari diplomat. I tell you this. I I went to the US. I was asked to move to the US because of the problem of Al Jazeera. And every day, you know, I've been called by people uh, in the White House, in the State Department, and they were complaining about Al Jazeera. And I had to tell them, listen, do you complain about BBC coverage of your country? And they said, no. I said, then, OK, cons consider it another uh, um, uh, uh, communication medium like the BBC. Uh, and uh, so, so I think the complaint, the, the linkage of Qatar to the Islamists is really is to put more pressure on Qatar uh, to put the pressure or to change the, uh, the, the, the way Al Jazeera has uh, reported. And uh, to tell you the truth, Al Jazeera is a headache to every Qatari diplomat. Everywhere we have to deal. And I never dealt with it. I told them I don't deal with it. Uh, and and uh, so, so I think, you know, I think there's a lot of misconception. I think even when they when they when they added the issue of the Muslim Brotherhood and the different Islamists in their thirteen uh, uh, demands, uh, you know, I I think they uh, the the reason is really to put more pressure on Qatar and uh, to to really change the Jazeera or even to 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 close it off. So you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, we look. I, I mean, in Turkey, the president and the and the ruling party is is Islamists. In uh, in uh, your neighbor Malaysia, they are also Islamists. Should I say, oh, I'm not going to deal with them? No, I deal with them and I cooperate because I deal with governments. I, as a government, Qatar, as a go, the government of Qatar deal with other governments. They deal with the, the government of Singapore. Whoever in power in Singapore, we don't. It is not our business what party uh, role in Singapore or in, uh, in, 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 in Malaysia or even in Iraq. We, you know, we like governments deal with governments. And, uh, but uh, unfortunately, we, 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 we've, been, we've, been, we've been demonized uh, by, by a certain quarter in the West before and later on it, it came from our neighborhood. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, with the time, the amount of time we have left, I'm going to strategically uh, direct the questions that we have from the floor to our two speakers so that we, we make the best use of time. Uh, we have three questions to, to round off our, our dialogue for today. Uh, the first one, and I will put it to Professor Kamrava, is on, on the South Pass North Dome gas field. And the question from the floor is, uh, how significant does this gas field have a have a role in, 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 in bilateral relations between Qatar and Iran, and considering also the context of the jump in bilateral trade volume from 2016. So that's for you, Professor Kamrava. And Ambassador, uh, question to you from my colleague Asif. Uh, considering Qatar's position as the host of Taliban's office since 2013 and relationship with Iran, does it help Tehran mend ways with the Taliban, especially after the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. And then finally, the last question for both our speakers to end off our discussions from Ekaterina from the floor. And the question goes back to the, the GCC blockade. And you know the question is about whether the quartet will have to pay for the losses suffered by Qatar in one way or another. And the, the, the losses as defined by our by the question here is not it's not about uh, uh, the loss of trust, but really on alliances and financial support. So, so I'll start with Professor Kamrava on the gas field. Um, you know, uh, the gas field is, uh, as His Excellency mentioned earlier in the program, uh, the world's largest, and and uh, it's it's a lifeline for Qatar and and incredibly important for Iran. It isn't necessarily a lifeline, but incredibly important for Iran. Iran hasn't been able to capitalize on it as much as it would like 
because of the sanctions uh, that the United States has imposed on Iran and the fact that uh, almost no one is able to engage in banking or any other kind of uh, uh, commercial transaction uh, with Iran. So uh, it's uh, the, the common gas field is incredibly important. It is probably the reason why some people in Doha and some people in Tehran uh, have to like each other because they have to collaborate and cooperate. You can choose your friends, but you cannot choose your neighbors. And so, you know, despite lack of trust, despite uh, whatever, uh, they have to collaborate and cooperate. Uh, but, but I think it's a, it's a strategically important lifeline. The Iranians, have been uh, trying to move increasingly away from oil and gas dependence over recent years. This has been not just rhetoric, but also in terms of indicators of domestic industrial production. Nevertheless, they have not been able to detach themselves completely from petrochemical dependence. And so for the foreseeable future, the gas field is going to be of tremendous strategic and economic importance to Tehran. And in that sense, of course, uh, they will continue to pay attention to it. And um, as His Excellency also mentioned, as long as this region is the primary um, energy provider to Asia, the Americans are going to be here. So everybody will just have to learn to get along. Thank you, Professor Kamrava. And over to you, Ambassador, on uh, the next question regarding uh, the Taliban's office. Well, the you know the Taliban office uh, was created for the uh, for for them and the American to 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 sit together. I mean, this uh, it wasn't only Qatar ideas. I think you know they, it, it was also the ideas of the of of the two parties. And so I don't see what role uh, that office will play uh, concerning Iran and Taliban. If I understood the question, is that a question? Because uh, look, uh, we, we have to wait and see what's happening in Afghanistan. I mean, you know, the American pulls out, the, the Taliban seem to be expanding. Uh, a few days ago, the Taliban, they were having meeting with the Iranian government in town. So I don't think they would need uh, the Iranian and, uh, and Taliban, they would need uh, the, the good offices of the Taliban office in, uh, in Doha. I, I think, you know, we are beyond that. I think uh, for the first time, you see Taliban moving back and forth to Tehran, to Moscow, to, to, to other countries. I, and of course, if, if uh, the, the, the end game in Afghanistan in the next few weeks, a few months, if there is a, a coalition government, then you know, there's no need. I mean, Iran will be dealing with whoever is in, you know, in power in, uh, in Kabul. If the Taliban for some reason become the main uh, ruler of Afghanistan, also, uh, you, you know, uh, Iran will deal with them because they are their neighbors. I mean, uh, look, you know, uh, Afghanistan and the Taliban, they are not the neighbor of Qatar, they are the neighbor of Iran, uh, they are the neighbor of uh, Pakistan uh, and the other countries, including India and China, etc. So I think uh, we, we have to wait. But I assure you, if we in Qatar, if, if Qatar uh, will be asked by Iran or by other, or by the Taliban, Qatar will be happy to to and the two facilitate. The uh, Qatar role in any in any issue is really to facilitate. We we don't impose, we, either we don't you know we don't impose. We 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 are just interested in stability in the whole region. If we all can work together and stabilize Afghanistan and you know uh, and other countries, that will be good for Iran. It will be good for the Gulf. It will be good for the whole region. 
So uh, I don't think you know there will be a need for it when it comes to Taliban and Iran, especially last week. Uh, you know the Taliban were in Tehran, so you know I don't think they will need us. Thank you, Ambassador. And one final question that will wrap up our discussion for today uh, on on whether you know uh, the the quartet, anti Qatar quartet, will have to pay for the losses and pay in the sense of. Uh, alliances, losing support in alliances and financial support. So, in, you know, we'll redirect it back to Professor Kamrava before, before His Excellency. Well, certainly, uh, Mohammed bin Salman has damaged credibility. He quickly proved to be the new Saddam Hussein of the Middle East with his misadventures, not just in relation to Qatar, but also in Yemen, in Lebanon, uh, in a whole variety, now most recently in Jordan. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, he's got some um, credibility issues that he needs to settle. And we've seen the price he's had to pay in terms of his relations with the United States after Trump left office. Uh, so uh, surely the quartet has a credibility problem. Qatar didn't do anything to provoke 2017. It was those guys who took the uh, initiative to try and bring Qatar to its knees. So I agree with the questioner that they need to, um, they at least have a credibility problem. But imagine a country like Jordan, uh, sorry, a country like Egypt has a deep uh, diplomatic history. And so it is much quicker to uh, establish its credibility um, in relation to 2017 uh, than someone, than a youngin uh, like Mohammed bin Salman. Thank you, Professor Kamrava. And the last comments from Ambassador Al Khalifa, over to you. Uh, could you, could you, could you repeat that question? Because sure. I like to, to understand it. Uh, sure. So will the anti Qatar quartet have to pay for the losses suffered by Qatar. And by pay, the questioner says, you know, the, in terms of alliances and financial support. You know, I think they already paid. They, they paid in terms of their, um, of their reputation. They paid in terms of the, of the trust of other countries. Uh, and uh, look, you know, when you come, when you wait almost a month, to, uh, to bring your demand after you cut diplomatic relations, then you really have a problem. And, and, and when these demands are demands which you, you know that no country will accept any one of them, because that was our position from day one. None. We, we told them, we told everybody, we, we will never accept not even one of these demands because accepting them, that means we lost our independence. That means we, 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 we don't exist as a state. So I think they really, they paid also in the eyes of their own people because you know the, when they have done it, everybody thought they really have some uh, legitimate uh, issues. And then later on, everybody discovered there's no legitimate issues. They, they paid for it because they really helped the stability of the region, its economy. Everybody lost. I mean, before the before the uh, before the uh, cut of relation, there used to be you know every day tens of flights between Qatar and Dubai, tens Qatar Airways and Emirates. I mean, every half an hour they they were the flight. The same with the Saudis. Think about. And, and they were the highest, I mean, you pay for your flight from Doha to Dubai more than what you pay from Doha, London, back to Doha, okay? It is really, I mean, there, there were a lot of uh, demands, not only by Qataris and Emiratis, but also by the international communities who live in Qatar and, and live in Dubai, business people, etc. cetera. So, uh, you know, Qatar now is not looking for any, uh, any compensation or uh, any cost to be paid by the other parties. But we are looking forward now and uh, is, is, is really to, to, to move forward, to try to uh, build 
the the trust to to make people ordinary people feel they are welcome in in this in this uh, in in Qatar but also in the other countries and uh, I just want to mention during that time we never we always welcomed our brothers from the Emirates or from Bahrain or from Saudi Arabia from Egypt while our people it was in Ramadan some of them they were kicked out of their hotels and and they were and they were you know it was it was the holy month of Ramadan they were in Mecca and somebody knocked the door and said you have to move and then they did not even allow us to send our plane to take them think of it that look there's a lot of damage there's a lot of hurt and 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 for us that there's nothing will compensate that. What will compensate is that we have to we have to swallow our pain, and we try to look for the future in a way that we we build our relation with our brothers, we build our economies together, we build our securities together. We try to extend our hand to all our neighbors, helping them, including Iran, including. Uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, uh, you know, uh, and and even other, uh, other, you know, and even other countries in Africa, because they are all our neighbors. You know, to me, they are our belt. We have to take care of them because we are the only countries which, by accident, by ge uh, by geography, we we. We are the richest because of oil and gas. I mean, I'm not talking about Qatar, I'm talking about the whole GCC, okay? And we have a small population and uh, majority of people who live in most of the Gulf countries, they are not from these countries. They are international communities. In Qatar, I think 90%, 89% of the people who live in Qatar, they are not Qataris. They are from everywhere, okay? And uh, so I don't think we are looking for any, you, you know, cost, you know, uh, in politics, certain costs, uh, you say, I will let it go. You know, I don't need it. I need, I need to build the trust. I need to build, uh, um, I, need, I need to change the mindset in everybody. And that is very important and it takes time. I hope Thank I you. answered. I hope I answered. I, I hope I understood the question because that question is a bit uh, tricky. Huh? Yes, yes, sure. And, and I think we can agree that, you know, even though reconciliation at the track one elite interstate level, it has been done, you know, there are still bridges to men, you know, going down from, from track one to track two and three and, and the grassroots. So we can all agree with that. And, and that, that's a good way to to wrap up our discussion for today, where I thank our two speakers for giving us such an enlightening, enlightening and enriching dialogue. And also thank you to the audience for your questions. And I think we, we covered a great deal of ground today. So again, my sincere thanks to our two speakers and also on behalf of the Middle East Institute, I would like to thank everyone and also apologies for the disruption at the start. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ma'asalam. Ma'asalam. Ma'asalam.